For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Brian. I get to be here. I get to be here. I get to stand at this pulpit and deliver this message to you today. So it's a privilege. It's an honor. Um, God has really been working on me during this season of uh, our, our going through and discussing strongholds. Really working on me. Have you been feeling the stretch? Have you been feeling the pull? When we bind ourselves to Christ and we're making an honest effort to bind ourselves and be united with Christ and walk in his ways, it always seems that there's a little bit of a battle and a pulling the other way. Am I right? Am I, am I the only one? Even if it's not in my character or my decisions, I can feel this pull from the plans that the enemy would use against me, his strategies, um, the world, uh, my carnality. And I have been on an honest search and discussing my life before God and I have been finding, as I look in the mirror at my own life, just how wretched I am. And it's not because of something that the enemy made me do. It's because I am wretched inside and out. My flesh wants to do things. My flesh is constantly craving for the things of the world. And I loathe myself at times because of the way that I am. And this, this search that I've had for God when I think about His holiness and He calls us to be holy and man do I want to be holy. Man do I, I want to have those times and those consistent times in my life where the intimacy between me and my God is so close and where I'm just feeling His presence and I'm feeling His confidence and I'm feeling His mercy flowing through me and I'm feeling His message flow through me to other people that I meet like on the bus or whatever. I want to be used by Him. But... I want to have it my own way. That's the problem. That's the problem. So this, it, this message is about who God says we are. And he says a lot of wonderful things about us. We are his children. We are his chosen if we have decided to invite Christ Jesus into our lives, if you have invited him to come into your life and rule your life and you have made him Lord, you are his chosen. He calls us his beloved and so much more. And I have, I've selected some scriptures here to talk about who he says we are. This is the hard part. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And this is going to be verses 1 through 3. And you he made alive when you were dead. You were made alive when you were dead. You were dead. I was dead in my trespasses. I was dead, slain by my trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you walked at one time. Habitually. 
you were following the course and fashion of this world where under the sway of the tendency of this present age. Let me say that again. You were under the sway of the tendency of this present age. This is not talking about past tense. This is talking about the here and now. The sway and the pull of this present age that we live in now. On this planet. And it is getting worse. Don't you know that every step you take towards God... The enemy is taking another to snatch you out of his presence. But the problem is that my carnality, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, keep on reading and then we'll talk some more about this. You were following the course and fashion of this world. You were under the sway of the tendency of this present age. Following the prince of the power of the air, that's the enemy, you were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience. Now, hang on to that. Sons of disobedience. Let's just put a tack in that and pop that one in the air because we need to remember this. The careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. Among these, we as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh. And our behavior, behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature. And we were obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind and our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of God's wrath. We were dead. We were under God's wrath. and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. That tells me because my natural impulses as a human being in this bag of flesh is to go after the sensual senses, to go after the things that make me feel better, right? Uh, it's okay if I have a drink here and there. I'm on vacation. It's all right. Just relax. I owe it to myself. I can't sleep if I don't smoke some weed. These are some of the excuses that we use to give ourselves permission to go ahead and do what makes me feel good. That's just some of them. Excuses. But I have to ask myself, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand now. And look, man, I'm not the fire and brimstone teacher. If you've never heard me speak before, I'm not normally like this. But I've been asking God, and I'm, I was asking him, what do you want me to talk about? Because, look, when we see things like this, I saw this, I'm looking at this line up for the sermon that was handed to me to deliver and it's it was so like we want to hear I want to hear because it makes me feel better I want to hear stuff like this 
let's go ahead and go to point one. Fearfully and wonderfully made. This is Psalm 139. This is the stuff that I want to hear because it makes me feel better. Oh, Lord, you have searched me thoroughly and have known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising, and you understand my thought far off. You sift and search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word in my tongue still uttered. And But behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have beset me and shut me in and behind and before, and you have laid your hand upon me. Your infinite knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high above me. I cannot reach it. Where could I go from your spirit? Oh, where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend it up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield the place of the dead, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your light shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the night shall be the only light about me. Even the darkness hides nothing from you. But the night shines as the day and the darkness and in the light are both alike to you. I mean, these are beautiful things that we're saying to the Lord and, and how he created us. For you did form my inward parts and you did knit me together in my mother's womb. I will confess and praise you for you are fearful and wonderful and your and for the awful wonder of my birth wonderful are your works and that my inner self knows it well my frame was not hidden from you when i was being formed in secret and intricately and curiously brought as if embroidered with various colors like he his thoughts are so about us. Every detail. He knows us. He knows us. He's called us. He loves us. When I think about that, how much he loves me. Did you know, Dougie, that you're his favorite one? Right. Cody, you're his favorite one. You're his favorite one. When he thinks about you in your relationship with him, in that moment, and this is the God of the universe who knows everything. He put it all together. He holds it all together from the big the outer space, the stars, to the very smallest little cell. At the moment of your conception, he knew about it, and he blasted that light and that energy, and he said, yeah, there he is, my favorite one. When he's thinking about you as his father, you are his very favorite one. No matter what is concerning you, it is so important to him. That's how much he loves you. You're his favorite one. Do you get what I'm saying? When it comes to you and he wants you. He wants you to spend time in his chest. Laying up against him. Experiencing his breath. Go back to Ephesians. We were dead before coming to him. We were dead. Just driven by this stuff. Just 
Whatever makes me feel good. And then I come to him. But God, so rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us even when we were dead and slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses and selfishness and lust. And anger and rage and jealousies. See, all these negative things, it didn't matter because of him. But God. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him for it is by grace and his favor and mercy which you did not deserve that you are saved and delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. But the problem is, I can be doing all these great things for him. Like, I realize how much he loves me. And I know that for me, for this kid right here, I owe him my allegiance. I have to do what he calls me to do. I have to say what he calls me to say. I, I can't not. But my problem is, that I want to do what I want to do because I like it. We like it. We like the sensual nature. We like... Kids like to be scared. Kids like to go, you know, watch horror movies or whatever. Like, we like to have our senses stimulated. I like to have people tell me how good a job I'm doing. It help, makes me feel good. It makes me feel great. And then my pride puffs up. And then Gretchen has to remind me that my pride is puffed up. <laughs> I, I, I want to be holy. We need to be holy before him. If there are things in our lives that that list of stuff in Ephesians 2 all the way through verse 3, if there is, are things in that list that I'm still walking in, the devil didn't make me do it at this point. I chose to do it. I'm walking in straight up disobedience. Jesus is coming soon. He is coming soon. I don't want to be the one when I see his face. I want him to be saying, well done, good and servant. Come. I don't want him to say, dude, I never knew you. And here's the thing. I had that salvation experience. I've had intim intimacy with Christ. Right? But I can't let that be an excuse to go ahead and, and do. I can't let this disobedience and this junk over here in, 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 in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. I can't let that dictate my life. And I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it does. It does. Can you, be, can you honestly say that you're never controlled by those kinds of thoughts where you just want to do what you want to do? I forget about God sometimes. I'll be honest with you. I go about my day and do me. 
I mean, I'm not out there getting high anymore or, or getting drinking or doing these. It's the obvious stuff that I'm not. No, no. That just takes me on down that spiral. And the next step for me, if I touch any of that stuff, I'm going to, it'll, it's going to kill me. Right? But I don't even want to come close to that anymore. I want to keep moving towards God. I want for him to, when he sees my, when I see him face to face, well done, good and faithful servant. He calls us to be holy. He calls us holy. He calls us beloved. He doesn't want us to be separated from him. But if in that moment when I'm trucking on down the road and there's a pretty girl and I'm looking at this pretty girl and I'm just gawking and letting my eyes just travel on down there, I honestly feel if I have an accident and I die, I'm going to have to answer for that. I'm going to have to answer for it. There's, a, there's grace and there's mercy and there's judgment and there's justice and there's righteousness and there's unrighteousness and we are all somewhere in the middle. Do we have to? No, we're not. Really, not in the middle. We choose to go to the middle. I want to be on this side of it. I No. I can't be walking around in my carnality. We can't. We can't afford to. At this point, Jesus is coming soon. I'm telling you, it's tick-tock, tick-tock. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Yeah, okay. But really, if I'm walking around and I'm purposely in disobedience, I am not acting like a very saved person, am I? And there will be judgment for that. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Don't go to hell, please. It's a bad decision. But God's so rich in his mercy. In order to satisfy that great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, by our own shortcomings. He made us alive together in fellowship. He made us alive together in fellowship, but for fellowship with Him. He wants nearness with us. Go to Matthew 5, 9. This is one of the things that he calls us. Blessed. Enjoying enviable happiness. Spiritually prosperous. With life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward conditions, are the makers and the maintainers of peace. For they shall be called the sons of God. Or in a short version, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemaker. That's just one. Sons of God daughters of God, princes, princesses, kings, and queens in his courts. 
imagine. You ever seen the Chronicles of Narnia movies, the Narnia movies? Royalty, that's how he sees us. The sons of God, we're adopted into his family. He's adopted us. Romans 15, 7. Accepted. It says here, welcome and receive to your hearts one another then, even as Christ has welcomed and received you for the glory of God. Accepted. We're accepted. He accepts us. He accepts us, but he can't really hang out in that intimate clutch if we're walking in disobedience as children of wrath in our former stuff. He always wants intimacy with us. The Israelites in the Old Testament, his chosen people, man, did he ever take care of them. He gave them signs and he fed them and pulled them out of danger during that journey out of Egypt. So many things happened in that. Bob, there's a story that you need to check out. And, and the children of God were so disobedient and he accepted them into his clutch he pulled them out of Egypt because they wanted to have the freedom to worship God in the way that they worship God and he said let my people go. And so they went. And they went after being saved and pulled out of that place and walking through the ocean on dry land. They went right back to their old carnal, sinful disgusting nature and thus separated themselves from God, the true God, and worshipped the animal. They were worshipping a cow. <laughs> but they went back to the animal, the animal instinct. God didn't create us to be animals. He created us to have flesh to walk around in, but he created us as spiritual beings for the purpose of unity with him. He gave us the whole world to play with at creation. He gave us dominion over the things of this planet, but we jacked it up. Here's another thing that he says about us. Okay. First Peter one twenty three. We are born again. 
We have been born again. Which means you have been regenerated. Wait a second. Been regenerated. So Ephesians says you were dead, but you have been regenerated. Like turning on the ignition. Right? Something happened there. Regenerated. The lights came on. The car started. Generator. Generator. You turn on the generator when the electricity is not working, right? When something is not working, you turn on the generator and it works. You've been regenerated. Born again. But from one that is, okay, not from natural Oregon, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living and lasting word of God. Wait a minute. Okay, so let's read that again. Born again, you have been regenerated, not from mortal origin, not from seed or the sperm or nothing like that, okay, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living and lasting what? Of by the everlasting what? The word of God. Okay. Being regenerated by the word of God. That means, okay, I should probably be reading my Bible because that's the Word of God. That's going to be applied to my mind and my intellect, right, which makes me do the good stuff or the bad stuff that I do. And if I want to stop doing the bad stuff, then I need to learn some good stuff to do because I've been doing the bad stuff for so long that this is what I naturally want to do because I like it. Because I've been controlled by my carnal nature, which, by the way, is opposed to God. They're arguing with each other that's why i feel like i'm being pulled in two directions my problem is what feels the best is probably the way that i'm going to be mostly inclined to go but i need to read the word of god to understand what it is and what it requires because okay First thing, I need to be saved. I need to have a relationship with Jesus. So I ask him to come into my life and my heart. And now I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in the carnal? I need to learn the things of the spirit by reading the word and spending time with Christian people. Spending time in church around other Christian people who know how to act like Christian people and do what this Christian thing is all about so that I don't get swallowed up by this again. Because I know I will go here if I'm not here. I'm either with the Lord or I'm not with the Lord. There's really no center line. The center line is a very precarious place to be. If I'm walking both sides of the fence, there's no secret agents in the kingdom of God. If I'm over here, I'm not under his protection. He can't really hang out with me if I'm not choosing to hang out with him. 
I mean, it's true. The scripture says that he, you know, he will never leave you or forsake you. And, and, and he will be with you wherever you go. But that's not just a blanket statement right there. If I'm, if I'm in my sinful nature, if I'm exposing myself to all kinds of crap on TV, in those moments, if I'm, man, when I, when I was in my addictions, I knew the word. I knew the word. I'd been discipled, and I chose to go the wrong way. And I remember carrying on in those addictions and you know, trying to make myself feel better, you know, about being in the state that I was in. And I remember that scripture hit my mind. Well, you know what? I mean, God loves me and he's never going to leave me or forsake me. And he's going to be with me no matter where I go. But I didn't have the understanding that, look, he's not coming with me to go get high. He's not, he's not going with me to do that. He's not going with me into the set. He's not going with me. He's not going with me when I turn on the Netflix and I put on some crap that I shouldn't be looking. He's not. He can't sit in the same room. His presence is not there. And to be quite honest with you, when I'm doing that, I'm not thinking too much about him. I'm not giving him the time and the intimacy because I'm watching the crap on Netflix and I'm into that. I remember them times on the set, man, and it's like coming out of that and I'm having this conversation with God and, it's like, and I'm like, man, Lord, I must have just broke your heart when I was doing that. What was it like for you when I was doing that, that song that I sang, The Way? Were you listen? Were you? Did the words get in? Did you pray for me the evening when I passed you by? Oh Jesus, did you start to cry when I lost the way? Because the way is always there. I lost it somewhere, and I'm doing my thing and and in my mess and. He's just over here. He's watching from afar because his presence isn't with me. He's watching from afar and just like, come on back, please. Just come on back. Just, just stop this. I love you. I died for you. I have so much more for you than this. I don't want you to die like this because I don't want to be separated from you. It breaks his heart. It breaks his heart. Let's go to John 1. We have been forgiven and so much more. Even as in his love he chose us, he actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, consecrated and set apart for him, and blameless in his sight, even above reproach, before him in love. For he foreordained us and destined us, and he planned in love for us to be adopted 
and revealed as his own children through Christ Jesus in accordance with the purpose of his will because it pleased him and was his kind intention so that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace and his favor and mercy which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, your beloved. He calls you beloved. In him we have redemption. You're redeemed. And deliverance and salvation through his blood, the remission and forgiveness of our offenses and the shortcomings and the trespasses in accordance with the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor which he lavished upon us in every kind of wisdom. Like he knew what he was doing. He chose us on purpose. He chose us on purpose. See, I'm, I was reading this and it says, let's see. Even as in his love he chose us, and actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. He chose us before the foundation of the world. And he says, you know what, Uni? I chose you before the foundation of the world. So be holy. That's what he's saying. Be holy, Uni. Follow me. Be holy. That's what he's saying. He's not, he didn't choose you. Holy. Now, there you go. Be holy. Decide to be holy. Make a choice. I chose you. I love you. You're my beloved. I put this, I've given you everything you need to walk this out. Now, read your word. Read the Bible. Read my words. Pray. Talk to me. Spend time with me because I love you and because it's vital because I'm coming back soon and I'm coming to get you but you got to be ready I'm coming back for a pure and spotless bride ladies on your wedding day did you make sure that that gown was spotless like everything had to be perfect oh I got some makeup on my dress. Ah! No, man, you made sure that that dress was spotless. You didn't have no eyelash going over here. You, every bride that I've seen is gorgeous. Even the ugly ones are gorgeous. Because they have taken their time and devoted every action to making sure that they are ready for the groom to come. It's important. There is a sense of urgency in that ceremony. They are getting ready. Man, I want to be ready. Don't you? Romans 8. We have been set free. We have been set free. We were dead, and now we're set free. We were in bondage, driven by our carnality, and now we're reading the Word and learning how to walk it out 
not doing this no more. Now we're able to really walk in righteousness. We're able to do it, not just read it. And now you are the righteousness of God. Hey, all right, cool. I'm the righteousness of God. Little do they know that I'm a scumbag at home and doing all this stuff. But yeah, I'm the righteousness of God. Whoop, whoop. I want to actually be the righteousness. I want to know that I know that I'm, oh, I'm getting close. I'm putting forth an effort. I want intimacy with God. I want to know his, I want to know his voice. The, his sheep know his voice, right? Oh, my gosh. I'm sitting here, and the guy's saying the sheep know his voice. And, oh, I don't know his voice. Can you put yourself in that category? Do you know his voice when he's talking to you? Can, can you feel it in your spirit, or is it just your conscience? saying this is right or wrong. I want to know him, man. I need to know him. I need to walk in righteousness. I, need, I don't want to go to hell. I'm being saved right now, Pastor Jason. Like I'm dying. I'm desperate for him. I need him to save me. And I've been doing this for a while. And I thought I was okay. And I know that I'm okay. But I want to be more okay. I want to be better than okay. We sing these songs, I'm confident in you, or whatever. You are my confidence. Are you really my confidence, God? I want for him, if I'm going to sing and I want it to be true in my life, not a, not a front. I need it to be real. I want to be real before him. I want to be vulnerable before him. I've been going through this season and I'm uncomfortable and I like it because I need to have this desperation in my life where I'm making decisions to follow and follow and follow him on the repeat in my life, with my heart, with my whole heart. I desire you, oh God, with my whole life. I need you. Like that kind of desperation when I'm in the car by myself. God, I can't do this. I'm a scumbag and I need you, God, to save me now. Like when I first called upon his name and he saved me, I'm calling on his name and he's saving me. Day in, day out. That's. That's pleasing before his sight. A contrite and broken heart. He will not despise. He loves you so much. And knowing that he loves me, man, I mean, it gives me the, the confidence to know that he's got a plan for me. That, that he's given me the tools. Them thoughts that come into my mind, those strongholds and those walls and them things that, that I've been carrying with me all my life that have kept me separated from him. He has given me the authority to talk those things down to crush those strongholds, to tear down those walls. Just like Joshua 6, 15 through 16. Now, I'm a worshiper, man. I'm up here. Gretchen and I come up here, and we are like, we're not just going up there. The thought isn't, Okay, well, we got to go play at church again sun, Sunday, honey. We know what we're doing it for. See, what we're doing is like the worshipers going around the walls of Jericho. That's why we're doing this. We are sent out in front of the army. By the way, you guys are the army. Like, 
how about some backup here? Because half the time I feel like it's me and Gretchen are out there alone. We have a few worshipers here who come up in the front, and I see Cody, man, and he is up here, and he's singing with his heart. He is consistent. He comes up. He makes it on purpose decision. Cody has a spot on the wall that he is guarding. He is a soldier. For what Cody lacks, and he feels those things that he lacks, God is restoring. God is fortifying. He's making you into a new man. He's making you into a better man than you could ever imagine that you could be. But you love it. You love being a warrior. Cody is not a backseat Christian. He is a front seat Christian. I wish you all were front seat Christian. Cody shouts it. Cody claps his hands like he's banging that sword on the shield. He is ready to go to battle. He is worshiping the Lord, and the walls of Jericho are going to come on tumbling down. The walls are going to come down on the seventh day. They rose early at daybreak and marched around the city as usual. On that day, they compassed the city seven times. And the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. Do you have walls in your life? Do you have strongholds? Are you still dealing with something? We are at the end now. This is the last sermon for this stronghold series. So, I want you all to stand up. And we're going to get loud. Give it a battle cry from your chest. Open your eyes. Look to the heavens. And shout! Ah! Thank you, God! Let's hear it. Come on! Woo! Hallelujah! Sometimes you have to shout at the enemy to get him off of you. They, oh man, like, sometimes I got to just, if I'm thinking about something, something is pressing me, I just got to knock it off. Stop. Lord, I'm. I am covered by the blood. Lord Jesus, I bind my thoughts to you. I bind myself to you. I don't want to think this way no more. You thought, behave. Get away. Talk to your thoughts. Take your thoughts captive. I have to. I have to all the time. Take my thoughts captive. And demand that they are obedient to Christ. You've been given the authority. He gave you authority. He calls you beloved. You're in the clutch. You're, up, you're, you're near to his heart. You're already there. He died for you. And he rose for you. And he lives in you. And he longs for you to be called the sons of God. He longs. Creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Be revealed. Come out. Come out of your strongholds. Come out of your old way of thinking. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Help us. Fill us. Rejuvenate us. Start us up. Build us. Come in, Lord, and live inside of us. We love you.
We want to love you better. You're holy, and we want to be holy. So help us, God, to rise up out of any darkness that is encamping around our minds and our actions. God, help us. Help me to call it out in my own life and put that old way to destruction and death, God, and to live a new life in you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.